COVID portal. So, uh, so very welcome to this seminar about the uh, circular transition in the plastics industry. Uh, so my name is Emma Lindahl and I'm a PhD student at the KTH, but I'm also of course responsible for a course uh, handling this uh, seminar. And this seminar is a joint uh, from the Circle Economy Initiative platform at KTH uh, and this course, Sustainable Development in Industry, given by KTH Södertälje, uh, the Campus for Sustainable Production Development. So whether you are a student or a professional, you are most welcome to this session. And so we are happy to uh, welcome and present Christine Geidemann Olofsson, uh, who is a pioneer in the Circle Economy field working at Tree World uh, as innovation and manager. So we are just welcoming Christine uh, to the scene and um, we will uh, ask questions uh, during the presentation if you want, and we will have a break and then we'll also start the second half of this seminar. So please welcome Christine. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, as I said, I hope you see my presentation now. You have a black square in the right corner. So let's see. Okay, thank you for inviting me here. Um, just to give a little bit more meat on the bone. Uh, I've been working with polymers, which means plastics, textiles and rubber. Uh, my whole career, which is now 35 years, years uh, in total, mostly in product development. Um, the last six years I've been at the Tree World, uh, which is a company producing polyethylene film. You will see more about that in a moment. Uh, I started as a, a development manager uh, doing the transition that the, we expect the plastic industry to do moving from, from a technical person to uh, a sustainable person instead in my position. Um, so uh, I will today uh, hopefully uh, enlighten uh, you all a little bit more on polyethylene. What is it? Everyone knows it, but you don't know what it is if we put it like that. Uh, and how we as a company have uh, started our journey to be a more circular company and leading the industry into this circular economy that we have to move into, otherwise we are dead, I would say. Uh, and how we have done it, uh, and also some, some good things at the end uh, where, we, where I tell the, the sort of result uh, at this stage of our journey. Uh, so I will go through, talk a little bit about Tree World, so you know what we are doing and how we are organized. Then I will talk about circularity within Tree World. Um, then we move into the industry as a whole. And last but not least, we always need to mention standardization. Uh, and you will understand why eventually. And I guess that Emma have talked a lot about standardization. Otherwise, I would be very disappointed, Emma. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I cannot see hands, I think. Maybe I can do that. Yes, I think. Um, but you're free to ask questions during the presentation if you want to. So. So, uh, Tree World, uh, we have uh, produced polyethylene film for since 1965. It was a family owned company from the beginning, but five years ago it was sold to a private equity firm called Altor uh, that have uh, allowed us to develop, uh, especially within sustainability. What we are uh, known for is uh, our competence within our area of, of expertise. Uh, we work very closely with our customers uh, and try to find the best solution for everyone. And this is sales talk, as you hear. But we have also realized that we need to 
to start over again in a way, we need to change our way of thinking and how to do business. So our vision, uh, driven by our customers' uh, present and future needs, we constantly strive to be the first choice in sustainable polyethylene solutions. This is exactly the previous vision, but we have added the word sustainable, which is uh, not only a buzzword that we use, even though we use it a lot, uh, but we have truly changed our way of working to be more sustainable. And the mission, we focus on our selected core markets with our core products. Uh, we are a natural part of our customers' competitiveness. And this have also uh, been brought into our world with a new dimension uh, recently or lately. Uh, we offer sustainable premium products, solution and solutions with the highest possible service level. Also here we have elaborated on this concept, which was fairly straightforward previously. Products, we, we produce a product, we sell it to a customer. But today a product can equally be a service. Uh, and the product have much more than the product itself in the concept. We also uh, sell the, the whole uh, costume around where you know how how uh, uh, sustainable your product are. You can choose between different varieties of products and so on. Uh, and we lead our industry's journey into circular plastics. This is extremely important for us. Uh, a little bit more about how we are organized. This is our uh, time uh, line that we have uh, had you will you will get the presentation afterwards uh, because there are a lot of uh, text here but uh, if you see 2019 2021 we have done quite a lot of acquisitions uh, our owners uh, see that we need to grow in this way uh, and we still continue to acquire new companies uh, in line with our strategy. Uh, and from the beginning, our name was actually Trioplast, uh, which was changed uh, last year uh, to Trio World because we are now taking on a more global perspective. Uh, still, we are located in Europe, uh, but not only in Sweden, which were uh, the biggest part of the company previously. We are 1,450 employees in 13 facilities, uh, and we have a turnover of approximately 600 million euros. Uh, our main production sites are in Sweden. We have uh, seven now, I think it is. Yes, we miss one dot there, I see. Um, and uh, we have factories also, one in Denmark, three in Netherlands and two in France, uh, but our market is global. Uh, we export as far as uh, to New Zealand, for example. Um, of our total converted volume of polyethylene, more than 22%, and there is a little uh, asterisk there, uh, more than 22% today is based on recycled plastics. And when we stay recycled, uh, in this case, we mean post-consumer recycled material and post-industrial recycled material. Uh, our aim is to be able to say, talk only about PCR, which is uh, the waste, uh, plastic waste uh, based recycler. Uh, post-industrial, it means uh, internal waste that is turned into recycled material. It can be transferred between factories, uh, but it's still uh, material that haven't been out on the market as a product. Uh, our sales split is, uh, as you see to the right, 77% uh, is uh, European, 18% is Sweden, and 5% is outside uh, uh, Europe. But 
uh, we expect that to be bigger uh, soon. Our organization, we are divided into five divisions. The biggest one is stretch film. Uh, and stretch film you have seen out on, on, uh, on the countryside, uh, uh, the bales, white bales, like sugar cubes that is out there, the white plastic around them or pink, yellow or blue uh, is done, uh, made by us. Uh, that's the big proportion of the stretch film pro product portfolio. Uh, we also do stretch film for load stability, you know, a pallet with boxes and you wrap them with a, a stretch film. Um, in this division, we also produce refuse bags, building and covering film, and waste wrap film, which is actually exactly the same as uh, pallet stretch film, uh, but based on recycled material. Then we have the industrial film division. Um, and that is uh, the division that do also load stability film, but not wrapping film. Uh, there are other varieties uh, of load stability. You have something called the stretch hood, where you have a big bag, you stretch it and you, you pull it over the, the pallet and then you release the stretch and then it shrinks to, to the pallet and also shrink film. Uh, refuse bags. Uh, when you go to uh, uh, and buy, uh, uh, what's it called? Planks. Is that the right name in English? Uh, from uh, Södra, uh, you go to Big Max and want to build something at home. You see the wrapping on, on uh, uh, the wood is uh, coming from us. Uh, called uh, forest industry film. So you see there are a number of products in, in the industrial film portfolio. Uh, then we have healthcare. Uh, we have one factory for that, where we do breathable film for hygiene applications, uh, embossed films for single use products uh, within uh, surgery, for example. Uh, we also have aprons and gowns here uh, and uh, uh, laminates used for, for medtech industry. Then uh, the division doing carrier bags. Uh, it's a small factory in Arvika in Sweden. They are, are the ones that have uh, been leading us into usage of recycled material. They have been working with that for a long time. And, and done all the uh, difficult steps when it comes to implementing uh, recycled material into our products. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the government in Sweden don't like uh, products with the recycled content, uh, not carrier bags at least, because the tax have almost killed this division. Now they have transferred because they are flexible into making uh, uh, bin, bin bags instead, which is what people buy uh, to replace the, the very expensive carrier bags today. And last but not least, we have the consumer packaging division doing uh, packaging for uh, food, but also for other uh, consumer uh, packaging goods, uh, not necessarily for, for human food, but pet food packaging, uh, packaging for sustainable tissue and so on. Uh, so these are the divisions we are uh, created from. Uh, so now, if you look at this picture, you understand that everything we do, I would say we, we have one small product that is reusable, but otherwise everything we do is single use plastic products. We are the bad guys. Uh, but we don't want to be seen as the bad guys, of course, because we realize that we need to take care of our products even after they have left us uh, one way or the other. And that is the journey that we have uh, started. So how did we transfer this uh, to circularity within our company? 
And this started approximately four years ago, where we understood that we needed to take a position here uh, and needed to define what exactly was meant with our position. What did we mean internally uh, with sustainability when it came to our, uh, our concept and strategy? So uh, our owners said that we expect you, Tree World, to be number one in sustainability. Uh, they told us that uh, four years ago, uh, and this is hard to measure, of course, but now we see the effect of our work because we have been quite successful in uh, taking a, this position on. So we, we shall be the preferred par partner uh, when a customer is looking for a sustainable uh, film producer. We uh, have developed a sustainable product offering uh, to our customers uh, and also uh, been able to provide the knowledge surrounding these sustainable products because again, this is a new world for everyone. What is the right choice to do? Is it to have a bio-based product? Is it to use less material in your product? Is it to use uh, recycled content in your product? Or what ch choice is the right choice? And we try to help our customers in the best way we can. In some cases, we even go in and say, you shouldn't do this choice that you came here for, but we can provide you with this choice and give enough information for them to feel safe and comfortable in their, in their choice of products. Uh, but we also need to, to be sustainable in our traditional way, uh, meaning uh, human rights, uh, energy usage, material usage, uh, LTR, and how, how our uh, employees uh, feel about our company uh, and so on. So we, we have tried to, to establish the, the pinpoints that is uh, super important for us and also created the strategy and the plan how to achieve this. So uh, the three buzzwords that everyone is using, remove, reduce, recycle. Uh, and we want to, to think about climate in everything we do, especially when it comes to innovation. So each division and each production unit and every employee is dedicated to minimizing our carbon footprint. Uh, we try to uh, not only say this, but also measure it uh, in a good way and a verifiable way. Uh, and remove, remove, reduce, recycle are keywords for us. Sorry, just yes. one quick question. Uh, how do you, when you choose to word remove, what did you think about and how do you interpret that one? Uh, well, it's mostly connected to uh, the word recycle because removing uh, plastic that is not in the right place. Uh, that was what was meant from the beginning, at least, that uh, using uh, plastic in a product again, recycle it, then at least we remove that proportion of plastic waste. Ah, okay, interesting. Yeah, cool. Mm, okay. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, based on what I've shown previously, we have also done some some wording uh, creation to to establish what exactly do we mean when we say sustainability according to us. So the sustainability declaration one, we believe in and off, will offer a uh, sustainable product offered, offering. Uh, so you can choose from a portfolio of sustainable products uh, in our portfolio. Our products is, uh, shall be recyclable. This is tricky because what's the definition of recyclable? And that is under definition right now, uh, both from a legislative point of view, but also from a standardization point of view. Technically, all our products is recyclable. You can melt them and do a new product, not necessarily the same product, 
but recyclability is also evaluated uh, from a market perspective. Is there anyone that want to buy uh, the used product and uh, use it in another product? If, if that is a criteria, not all our products is considered as recyclable. Uh, we need to uh, increase the recyclability, uh, as I said, uh, and uh, that is mostly done by use of PCR in our pro products. You will hear PCR many times. And I repeat, PCR is a product that have been used in this application and then uh, after usage uh, returned to waste and that recycled based on that waste is PCR. And it doesn't necessarily need to be household uh, plastics. Uh, it can also be the pallet stretch film when it's used and taken out from the pallet uh, and becomes waste. Uh, the recycler from that is also called PCR. So there are, PCR is a, a big category uh, with actually not yet defined divisions between different material streams, but that will come. Um, we uh, uh, have sorting facilities and mechanical recycling, and we are expanding uh, with mechanical recycling internally. So we integrate upstreams uh, right now, and we truly believe that mechanical recycling is the thing going forward, the most environmental friendly alternative and uh, achievable uh, by uh, working in the value chain, which is super important from, for us. Uh, so we have more than two recycling units. This text needs to be updated, I realize now. Uh, we have a, a recycling unit, we have bought a recycling company uh, that have a line in, uh, in Sweden, and we have uh, recycling of external waste in Denmark and in France. Uh, and all these units are now under uh, quite a uh, big investment role where we invest uh, uh, quite a lot of money in order to uh, make them better. Uh, but also to expand with more lines. Uh, we are very uh, serious with having fact-based and transparent communication. Uh, greenwashing is completely forbidden, both internally, but also from our owners. And in this industry, it's hard to navigate between uh, the different declaration that is not fact-based and not transparent. So we, we try to uh, be good guys and say, okay, this is how, how our interpretation of this is. Uh, and this is what it actually means when it comes to different concepts within circularity or plastics. We are working very much with influencing and contributing to improving the plastic industry, and that is mainly my job, but we are a lot of uh, missionaries within the company that is doing the same thing. Our CEO is uh, out presenting very much, but also other people. Uh, so uh, I'm working with a lot of associations and business organizations, but I'm also working very closely to the European Commission and the Swedish government in order to create a reliable, uh, but truly changing legislations and criteria surrounding the plastics industry. Um, and as mentioned previously, we have a very close, co close co cooperation to find the most suitable product for each customer, including have a, having a sustainable alternative alternative available for each application. So <clears throat> whatever product category you find in our portfolio, you can always find a sustainable alternative in that category. Okay. Excuse me. Yes, Ashraf, welcome. Yeah, actually, I want to ask about something that, uh, well, I think that recycling is done by some outsourced firms, yes, as you said that. Mm. They have been, and actually, I'm interested in that. Well, 
4,000 outsource firms, how you check the emissions, well, energy use, well, I mean that, well, especially an actual audit side of that, how you help check all those uh, standards. Uh, you mean when we evaluate the, the carbon footprint from, from different external suppliers? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. okay. Uh, well, we we have uh, we we are doing a lot of uh, GHG uh, um, measuring, but we use mainly. This is hard. Uh, tier one and two is easy because it's internal. We know what energy we buy. We know. Uh, uh, our materials ish. Uh, we know the transport that we get a very clear declaration on. But for the raw materials, it's not the transparent communication from uh, neither the virgin producers uh, nor the recyclers. The recyclers can measure equally as we do it. They are a sort of a converter. Uh, but that type of industry is very immature. So they they uh, haven't put any efforts in it. So we, we, our standardized methodology is okay. You're located in Netherlands, then most likely your energy comes from, from gas, for example. So uh, we have these assumptions that we need to take uh, in a bigger picture in order to do anything. Um, but the transparency from the polymer producers is almost nothing. Uh, so we use the modules that is in, in uh, the LCA programs, uh, and that is what we can do. We try to penetrate more. We, we also uh, participate in projects where uh, this, it's tried to be established in a better way and, and try to investigate more thoroughly what exactly is uh, the carbon footprint from the different processes. Uh, and, and for example, plastic based on, on natural gas compared to shale gas, what's the difference? Uh, but all the information is not there, but at least we are trying to, to use whatever is out there to do some sort of estimation. Was that the answer to your question? Uh, yes, and, and another thing is that even if you are choosing an outsource firm, that if you have a standard text that, well, you have to have EMS, you have to mm. show the origin standards, mm. and etc. like such. Yeah, yeah. Certification. Yeah, yeah, if there are a certification, of course, anyone want to use the certificates. But in some cases, one certificate can be. Uh, we we are in some cases more skeptical to to some certification schemes than others. Now, when I'm talking here, I should have my LCA uh, colleague uh, with me that could elaborate more on this question because I'm not the expert on that. But when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, bioallocated material, uh, there are different certification schemes. Uh, some are more trustworthy than others. So we try to avoid the ones that is not trustworthy. Uh, in order to, to be able to, to stand for our products and, and motivate that this product is, is bioallocated, but with a, a tight uh, very, uh, definition on, on how you do the, the calculation of the content, for example. So yes, if there is a certificate, and, and we try to buy certified materials. And in some cases, it's a must. So when we are talking about mechanical recycled material, the, the recycler have to have EU plus certificate. And that we know very, very well. We have the three of them uh, internally also. Um, we are working uh, actively with, with the organization that owns EU plus. So, uh, uh, 
if there are certifications uh, schemes to use, but in many cases there aren't. And in this world, this is under development rapidly. Uh, unfortunately, it's under development from the industry. Uh, so there are, in many cases, no standards to lean on, which means that uh, can you really rely on, on a certification scheme done by a business association, for example. So we need to be critical when we choose, and we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was so uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but it's a very good question. Actually, when we started to say that, okay, we have recycled content in our, our products, we decided uh, and expected our customers to pay more for that. Uh, our customers said, okay, you say you have 30% PCR in this product. How do I know that is true? You cannot measure it. Uh, chemically, the, the polymer is exactly the same as if it was virgin. And then we, we uh, uh, asked IVL in Sweden, the Swedish Environmental Institute, to do a report. We paid for it, yes, but that was because of time constraint. We needed the report rapidly. So they did a, a evaluation uh, of the existing uh, certification schemes for recycled content. And here was the problem, actually, the biggest problem is that every certification scheme is developed by a business association. And normally we go to our business associations and ask them for advice what to choose. But in this case, we couldn't do that. So, and, and IVL is very trustworthy and independent. Uh, so they did a report. And now this report is, uh, is, we are sharing it with anyone that wants to see it. They did a criteria list and a classification system between the different schemes. And uh, the outcome is that the scheme that was most trustworthy and most reliable and really proved that you had the recycled content in that product specifically, and not on a company level or a factory level, but that product that you buy with the recycled content, with the risk class certification, you know that you get that. And they, this report, we are now circulating to everyone. So we could also share it with you if you want to, uh, just to see how we have, have done it, not necessarily for the content of it, but the, the work uh, te technology, so to say, or the, uh, yeah, well, the way that we work. Uh, so it can be shared if you want to. Any other question? No, no, actually, it was all. Okay, thanks thank a lot. Um, then we have Trio World Sustainability Declaration 2. And what do we not believe in? Because this is also super important to, to say uh, very much. We don't believe in biodegradable plastics. This have created the, the launch of biodegradable plastic all, all over the place have launched uh, an even more criticized uh, world for the plastic industry. In many countries, in some countries, I would say, uh, biodegradable uh, identified products was uh, uh, made mandatory and, and normal plastic was not allowed, uh, which created a waste, uh, a litter problem that was even worse than before. And also these biodegradable polymers, they don't degrade everywhere. Uh, they only degrade in a very isolated uh, environment. And it takes quite a long time anyway, dependent on the thickness and the environment. So you end up with releasing microplastics based on biodegradable plastic in the environment. And it's not beneficial fitting for anyone. And if these materials come into the recycling stream, they are like poison. So they kill the pro properties of, of uh, the rest of, of uh, the material. Uh, so we don't use biodegradable plastic. We don't encourage anyone. And if anyone should come to us and say, well, we only want biodegradable, we try to convince them otherwise. Uh, we don't believe that chemical recycling will 
re replace mechanical recycling of plastic. And this may seem controversial, at least if you say it to the big fossil uh, industry. Uh, chemical recycling is, is a buzzword. Uh, it's not one process. There are several different processes. The one that is mostly encouraged from uh, the fossil industry is called pyrolysis. And actually uh, the material that can go into a pyrolysis process have a very uh, narrow specification of, of uh, material content, even more narrow than mechanical recycled material. And also you, you cannot use very much into the pyrolysis without destroying that process. And the output from the process is so dirty uh, because of the waste content. So you can almost not use it for new polymers, uh, new polymer production. And then it's not recycling anymore. Uh, and uh, there are so many concerns when it comes to chemical recycling, not only that the material doesn't work, but also uh, that uh, uh, the release of the uh, carbon dioxide is huge, the energy consumption is huge, and the LCAs that we see from the fossil industry is completely misleading. So we totally uh, avoid to, to promote chemical recycling, and it's not really on the market yet. There's a lot of talk, but no real material is out there. And uh, as a result, greenwashing, we never uh, go into any greenwashing uh, situation. We try to, to be very clear on, on different concepts and trends uh, to evaluate whatever is happening before we go into any statements of, of any sort. Uh, and we also try to educate our customers to our, our not so uh, non greenwashing uh, competitors, to, they need to learn to ask the right questions because you need to be more uh, fact seeking than ever in our industry. And uh, everyone needs to take that uh, uh, into consideration. Uh, if I may, just one question yes. concerning the uh, chemical recycling. Um, a very interesting topic, very interesting position, actually, <laughs> <laughs> kind of rare. <laughs> in our world. So I, I just wanted to, to be sure that I understood well. So um, do you make any difference between chemical recycling of mixtures and chemical recycling of pure materials, for example, polyethylene to polyethylene? Is that something yeah. that you can consider as something beneficial? Uh, as for now, uh... Pyrolysis can only accept uh, pure material streams. Okay. And with pure, uh, right now, and, and all the other chemical recycling technologies also have this limitation that you, you, you may be able to uh, re recycle, break down, I would say, because it's, it's breaking down the polymer backbone. Mm -hmm. You, you can do that for one material category at a time, but not mixing them together. You have a little, little margin of allowance where you can have a polyolefin mix, a, a poly, polyolefin uh, material with 3% polyamide contamination. That can be acceptable. But the normal mix, if you have a PET, P laminate, for example, that cannot be recycled in, in a pyrolysis. And, and the, the output from a pyrolysis process is like a cracker. So you have different fractions where two will be used for fuel and three will be used for other materials like oils, polymers, or other materials. Uh, and there you completely lose it. You can produce many different polymers out from that, not necessarily what came into the process. Uh, so, and also because this is not really available on the market yet, uh, we also uh, see the big question mark is on the uh, recycled content calculation methodology, 
where we have a, also a big greenwashing debate on how to do it. Because if you have a calculation methodology where you can move a credit from one factory in, in one country to a factory in another country and call the output in that the second country uh, polyethylene waste based without having a single molecule there. The, this is, uh, it's hard to respond to a question like that. There are never a line when it comes to pyrolysis where you have the pyrolysis unit in the same uh, site as the polymer production unit. So the output from the pyrolysis process needs to be transferred somewhere. Um, and, and the connection is not really there. Okay, so, thank you very much. Okay, very, thank you. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Uh, chemical recycling is another uh, lecture. It could take two hours in combination with the mass balance technology. Uh, <laughs> Would be nice if you can organize it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask Emma. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, just to show that we are down to facts. When we are doing our uh, sustainability work internally, uh, making the plan and the strategy uh, we are going down to, to details. So, for example, we have uh, decided that we will be able to offer products with PCR content, uh, with the PCR content totally in the whole portfolio. Uh, the target is 30% PCR in products in all our products uh, until 2025, because we expect uh, a legislative demand uh, until that time on packaging. And the majority of our products is packaging. Uh, recyclability, uh, today, all our products is considered according to our own definition as recyclable. But because we know that this year, uh, the packaging and packaging waste directive uh, revision will be published mid-year or something like that. And then we have new criteria to take into consideration to evaluate the recyclability of our products. And after that, we need to set uh, targets until 2025. And uh, until 2030, uh, the, the plastic strategy have said that 100% of products placed on the market shall be recyclable. But then it's not defined by what technology. Um, by what criteria? So there are a lot of question marks there. Um, we have also decided our brand for products uh, containing recycled material is called Loop. Uh, and we also uh, need to be able to, to provide this product. And uh, we want to sell on the market 50% of our products uh, last year, and we achieved that actually, uh, we achieved 55% also last year, was uh, loop alternatives that was bought by customers and wished for from the market. Because this has been a problem. We have had products with uh, recycled content for a couple of years, but the market wasn't even close to understand that they needed to do it or buy it. But now it, it starts to move, and uh, this is really exciting. So in order to achieve 30% recycled content in our whole material uh, mix, we need to sell the products, of course. Otherwise, we will never achieve that. So the aim is to have 75% of our total product uh, volume uh, being loop alternatives uh, by 2025. Ecobodies is a, a sort of platform where we report all our sustainability work um, and then have an independent valuation done uh, based on uh, uh, various criteria. Um, and the, the aim was for us to have gold this year, but actually we achieved platinum, which is the highest level last year. <laughs> so we are doing quite good. And uh, Ecovadis is used uh, by many big companies globally. Uh, so it's a sort of very good uh, uh, grade on our work. Um, 
Then we have other goals, of course, LTR, uh, lost time accident rate always should be uh, zero. We are at uh, two today, uh, but we work very hard with that. And we have had, that's the lowest number we have had in many years, actually. Uh, we have also uh, addressed how, how much uh, CO2 equivalent uh, per kilo material uh, reduction we should have within GHG scope one and two. Uh, scope three is, as I mentioned previously, it's hard to get the values, but we have set the targets on how much reduction we should have. Uh, we have also non-compliances, and here we don't have a system for the, the collection of the data yet. Uh, which were the hardest thing when we started the whole work. We didn't have any data internally even, so we have created the system to be able to first collect the data, but then also to monitor it over time. And we have also uh, decided that all our suppliers shall sign our code of conduct, uh, and we are achieving that more and more. Uh, we have many suppliers, both on raw material, but also other materials uh, that we use. So it will take some time, but the aim is to have 100% signed until 2025. So if we move into then sustainable solutions, uh, this is the concept that we are providing to the market. So we start with bio, which is bio-based, not biodegradable. Uh, bio-based plastic, you can uh, buy normally. The, the, the normal variety have been uh, sugarcane based from Brazil. Uh, that is a reliable product. It really contains bio-based content. But what we see now is that the uh, need for this have raised uh, increasingly, so now we need to uh, also look into bioallocated, which is mass balanced material uh, uh, with other sources, which can be good. Uh, and here again, you need to know very much about your materials when you're talking about this, uh, because what is exactly the content? What is the consequence of having sugarcane based? Uh, uh, feedstock uh, in the plastic? What does it mean in Brazil? Uh, is, the, is it transparent? What happens in Brazil to be able to get this material? Uh, and if you don't have sugarcane based, you have uh, based on other feedstock, what is that? Is it palm oil? How big proportion? Uh, for plastics, it's never certified palm oil. Um, if you have tal oil, how big proportion of the bio content is uh, based on tal oil, and so on and so forth. So there, you, you need to be an expert in, in your materials and, and these systems to be able to take a right decision and not end up with the greenwashing. And then you again have the, the calculation methodology for the content, what, what certification scheme is most reliable, not fully reliable, but most reliable. And we have chosen ISCC plus uh, that is, is lost, less greenwashing than the other ones. There are still question marks here also, but at least this is as good as we can get. So we are certifying our factories according to ISCC plus. Um, then we have loop, which is our favorite, of course, because we truly believe that the plastic that is put on the market needs to be circulated, uh, hopefully 100% one day, but that will uh, take some time, I think. But at least we can take the responsibility for the products we put on the market, and we work hard with that. So a uh, minimum of 25% PCR in a product in order to allow to call it a loop product. Uh, that is the current uh, criteria for a loop product. Uh, then we have lean, which is when we have done a thinner product in order to reduce the use of plastic raw material. 
uh, and still have the same properties as if it was a thick uh, product. Last but not least, this is under change uh, of name, Tree Greenway, uh, which is uh, the services that we provide to the market. So we have LCA uh, uh, that can be done on demand. Uh, we also do a lot of presenting like I do today. Uh, and work together with customers in workshops, for example, for them to be able to make the right choice and the best choice from a sustainability <coughs> point of view, sorry. <coughs> I've been talking a lot. Today. Yeah, that's great. I was just thinking I should be this break here, Christine. Uh, I have one more slide. Correct. Right, right. Okay. <coughs> so, LCA is a jungle, uh, as you know. It's all about um, what frame you put on it. So, we have a, <coughs> a standard calculation for our products um, that is uh, uh, evaluated of a third party in order to, to be correct. Um, we don't do it for the whole life cycle because that is not in our management. We, we don't have control over it. We don't have all the information. But uh, in specific requests from customers that want to cooperate with us and can provide <clears throat> their data, we are doing that anyway. So this is uh, about the concept. Um, and here I was thinking of a break. So, Emma, what do you say? Excellent, thank you. Uh, I, ten minutes is it's set enough for everybody, um, and for you, Christine. Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. So ten minutes. So let's start eighteen past two. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so then I continue. Uh, I've shortened the presentation a little bit because I had. Even though I had very good time, I, I completely filled my presentation. Well, anyway, um, so now I've been talking about Trio World and internal discussions, uh, but now I will talk about our engagement in order to bring the plastic industry as a whole to a more circular economy. Uh, and our, we have two big, uh, engagement when it comes to this. First of all, we have circular, and I need to correct the uh, misspelling, uh, Circular Plastic Alliance, which is an initiative uh, based on the plastic strategy and hosted by the European Commission. And the scope for Circular Plastic Alliance is to enable an, uh, 10 million tons uptake of recycled plastic used in products on the European market until 2025. Um, this is a big bunch of our engagement. Uh, the other part is standardization, so I will talk a little bit about that after this one. Circular Plastic Alliance structure, it has been going on since 2019, um, and we have been uh, participating since the beginning. Uh, it's divided into four different thematic groups, R&D and investments uh, that is needed to enable a higher uptake of recycled plastics, design for recycling, collection and sorting, and recycled content. In the middle, we have a steering committee that uh, try to uh, organize all the different thematic groups, but also the different sectors uh, that have uh, their separate working groups. So we have packaging, agriculture, automotive, uh, electronic and ele electrical uh, equipment and building and construction. And we have one ball here called monitoring because also here we realized we didn't have any data for the European uh, industry uh, when it came to how much plastic is put on the market, how much is taken up. So uh, within Circular Plastic Alliance, a monitoring system has been created and is launched this week actually um, to be able to participate in. And the monitoring is to know how much recyclate is 
put on the market, how much is taken up and in which products. Uh, to be able to, able to know that if we have achieved the 10 million tons or not. All the different uh, sectorial working groups, uh, the five ones are divided in the, into the thematic groups also. So the packaging have been working with all four thematic groups. Uh, agriculture and all the other ones have also done that. On top, you see General Assembly. Each year, there is a, a huge meeting showing uh, everyone outside uh, Circular Plastic Alliance what we have done. Uh, and who are we? We are approximately 300 signatories today, uh, covering the whole value chain, including some NGOs and some member states. Uh, and uh, well, we, we are covering the value chain and all the biggest uh, material flows. Last but not least, because in the work here, uh, equally as the commission have identified as a crucial uh, tool to be able to achieve circularity in whatever area we're talking about, energy, material, waste of any sort, uh, and plastic specifically, Standardization is identified as a key to achieve circularity in a common way. Uh, so CEN Sanoleken is the standardization organization in Europe. Uh, CEN for all things except electrical things and CEN for electrical things. And S-R-A-G-H, we love abbreviations in standardization. It's meant uh, standardization request ad hoc group. And what standardization request is, I will come to in a moment. So between the work, especially uh, when it comes to design for recycling that is done within CPA, there will be a bridge or there is a bridge called uh, standardization request ad hoc group that will transfer uh, the background material that is done in, in Circular Plastic Alliance to the relevant technical committees within some cell um, <clears throat> The scope for the work done in the standard, for the standardization request within the Circular Plastic Alliance was identified by the commission. So this is what the, the thematic groups uh, have been working on. Uh, covering the whole value chain. So design for recycling, quality of waste, quality of recyclers, and integration of recycled plastics in products. Uh, and I have identified the background material in order to achieve this. The standardization request is right now under what is called public consultation, which is the last step before acceptance. Um, so we, ex we expect it to be uh, verified and published uh, in April something. And then we have three years to develop all the standards that have been identified here. <clears throat> Within uh, CPA, uh, because packaging, for example, which is the biggest category, the biggest sector, <clears throat> we needed to decide what, what material streams should we work with, what would have the biggest potential to provide a quality recyclet, but also to have uptake of recyclets. Uh, so the JRC, the Joint Research Center, which is the research department of the European Commission, uh, <clears throat> with help from signatories, uh, developed this model, uh, which is right now under revision in order to see very visual uh, where you can find the different materials. Uh, and based on this, uh, we in CPA uh, created the design for recycling uh, <clears throat> uh, developers uh, in the different sectors. And they were divided as you see here. You don't need to read everything, but you, you understand that the packaging group have been working with design for recycling guidelines for uh, polyolefin flexible packaging, polyolefin rigid packaging, polystyrene, polyester, and EPS, <clears throat> such as example. And based on this, uh, the standardization request is now formulated uh, and in the standardization request, 
is uh, pro proposed to develop or guided to develop 58 standards. And normally in a technical committee or a working group, you develop two standards per year. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so this is huge. Um, <clears throat> so we continue with the standardization. Uh, in order <clears throat> to develop all these standards, we need to talk with all the different theses that are related. <coughs> uh, and this is only an example where we need to have communication between TCs, TC technical committees, I'm sorry. Um, so plastic <coughs> need to talk to energy related products that needs to talk to packaging, that needs to talk to plastic piping, that needs to, <coughs> to talk to Saba, which is the horizontal part of the CEN uh, structure. And why do we need to do this? Because a packaging waste doesn't necessarily uh, go into a new packaging. So uh, to, to <clears throat> get this circularity going, we need to talk to each other. And this is not the, the standard way haha, to <clears throat> work within standardization. And in ISO, we have a similar uh, structure where we also need to talk to each other. Um, and these are only examples on TCs that need to work together. And now I will run through uh, these parts, but this is to, to visualize why, why we have to do this <clears throat> um, in the plastic industry now. Um, and why without it, it will be, the, the commission won't be happy if we put it like that. So this is <clears throat> a focus on packaging, plastic packaging. Uh, and first of all, we need to, uh, we need to build this house uh, to establish uh, the framework of our work to be done in the future. And this is done already for virgin materials uh, and the virgin based products, but ne we need to rebuild it based on the circular economy. <coughs> I have definitely talked too much today. So first of all, we need the foundation. We need to talk the same language. So we have right now a standard uh, that is developed from Sweden actually, or a project led from Sweden, uh, that is defining vocabulary within circular plastic. Uh, <clears throat> we have the, the question about the post-consumer recycler, post-industrial recycler, that is out there and haven't been defined thoroughly previously. And what happens when we don't have a common language? We, we get these new words uh, that is very confusing. So what is, for example, bioplastic? Is it bio-based or biodegradable or both? Uh, this word should be banned because it only creates confusion. Uh, when the, uh, the commission was very uh, energetic and uh, released the single-use plastic directive, because Europe is leading uh, the transfer to circular economy, uh, this was copied in many other states in other uh, areas uh, globally, but there were a huge lack of definitions in, in this uh, directive. So in ISO meetings, India and Malaysia came to us and said, okay, you need to put your things together and give us the definitions because right now, any product that is based on plastic and only used once, a part in a computer or in a car, is considered a single-use plastic. So how do you define things? Uh, so this is a high risk, both, both to, to stall the discussion, <clears throat> but also to create an even more greenwashing uh, environment. What is recycled plastics? Uh, what is plastic? Because in single-use plastic directive, uh, 
they realized that there were not the common understanding on the definition of plastic, which is crazy in itself. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that we want have to do in order to enable a higher uptake of recyclers is to increase the quality of the recyclers and then create the, the criteria for the material to be recycled, which means we need to start with design for recycling. And we don't need to go into the details there. Uh, Again, we go into what is recyclable uh, and what is designed for recycling for, this is very specific for us, LDP flexible film for Bailra. Because if you look into the most common design for recycling guidelines for consumer, uh, for household uh, waste, uh, Bale wrap film would not be considered as recyclable, but it is recycled almost to 100% of the collected material. Uh, how should recycled content be calculated and verified? And uh, actually, when we started the, the CPA, we, uh, JRC also did a mapping of, of the existing definitions of design for recycling in guidelines on the European market and found more than 80 different and how should you then consider what is designed for recycling uh, we have the next uh, wall if you mix if you take all the very good designed products and mix them together uh, you have a, a waste that is of low quality because of contamination you need to sort things uh, so the next thing that is needed on standardization is a uh, quality system for waste. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is more or less what I said right now. Uh, in order to get a high quality recycler, you need to have isolated material waste streams in order to, to get that quality. Then we have the quality of recyclers. Uh, many people say that the recyclers should be exactly as virgin material, but that will never happen because in products you mix things, you have uh, colored plastics, you have printed plastics, you have laminated plastics and so on, which means that recyclers is not at all the same thing as virgin material. It's much more complex and you need to measure and verify many more different uh, properties than on a normal material or a virgin material. So here we have a base series of standards where we have the characterization of recyclers, uh, but this needs to be expanded. Um, yeah, we jumped that one. Uh, last but not least, to close the loop, you need to uh, integrate the recycled plastic in products. And here it gets really tricky because nobody wants to commit that they uh, can do it easily uh, because if one player on the market says it's easy to be done, then all the other players on the market will be fairly upset because they haven't done their homework. Uh, right now we are the bad guys because we are leading this and we are very loud about it. We go out on the market and say, we can manage to have 30% PCR in our stretch film, for example. Two years ago, that was considered as impossible, also internally. But we have done our homework. Um, and also we have realized in the communication with the market that the demand-driven standards is an absolute need for the market to accept recycled content in products. So if, if a big brand owner says, yes, we can buy a product with recycled content, but we need to write the specification and what standard should it be based on? And these standards needs to be developed. Uh, then we have sectorial needs, which uh, is visual visualized by the roof. You have the needs for a, a car application or a packaging application or a pipe uh, application and so on. Uh, so different needs for different sectors. We often hear in our market that we cannot use recyclers because we have so high demands on our products. 
our solution is to demand the relevant quality of the recycle because you can do that that is driving uh, a higher uptake, a better collection and sorting system on the market. Uh, we cannot use recyclers because recyclers are full with uncontrolled chemicals. Then you need to define, do you need to define the recycled feedstock, the waste feedstock, measure the chemical content and develop a standard based on your methodology. That is what we're doing right now. A film with the recycler does not look good. No, but then make the market like the sandpaper look um, and make recycled content a promotion, not, not something bad. So if we look for the future, this is how this house will look like. Because the plastic industry, the intention is to lock the plastic industry into this house of standards. And the, we have the opportunity to develop the standards ourselves now, and the ones that is not participating in this work cannot complain afterwards that it doesn't fit their business model. This is the intention from the Commission, and uh, if I should guess, I think it, it is a global move, movement going forward. So in five years, the plastic industry uh, will be locked into this house and uh, you will not find a, a way out from it, but we can participate in the standardization work to shape our own future. So, last, we uh, don't only talk. We don't only sit in discussions and try to uh, convince other players on the market that we have the right opinion. We are uh, walking, uh, walking the talk. So we have, for example, you will find this product in Swedish uh, retail stores, Skuna. Uh, that packaging is developed uh, in a project uh, that was between Rice, Ika, and SCT and us. Uh, <clears throat> And the baseline was to do, oh, sorry, uh, the chemical evaluation, the chemical content screening of the recyclers in order to ensure that this product is safe. Um, when COVID-19 started, uh, we started up very fast a pilot with the Danderyds Sjukhus here in Stockholm, starting production of aprons within months. What we also did was to start to collect the used aprons, recycle them and return the material to aprons again. This week we started the project of a verification methodology for the sterilization properties in the regranulation process in order to again ensure that the product is safe. Uh, the collected aprons is today classified as normal household waste, so there isn't a need to prove this, but in order to prevent discussions, uh, we want to do this project anyway, and this could also lead to a higher circularity of other plastics in, in uh, healthcare. We have uh, the agri loop, here you see the bales. Uh, in many member states uh, in Europe, we have collection schemes. They are voluntary and created by the industry uh, ourselves. Uh, and in Sweden, the collection scheme is called Svetbotur and have been going on for 25 years uh, with a high collection rate, up to 80, 85% of the total volume put on the Swedish market is collected every year. Uh, the collection scheme, uh, Svepotil, decided to invest in a recycling line a couple of years ago. This line is uh, super good. It's very high technical uh, level in this line because agriculture waste is normally contaminated a lot with soil and hay and other contaminants. Uh, but this line can clean the material so good, so the recyclers actually can be used in the same product. And if you were in the business, you would understand that this is a sensation. Uh, so we have now a closed loop uh, of agroplastics going into exactly the same product again. Uh, 
And this led to Trio World uh, acquiring the recycling line from the collection scheme. So now it's owned by us and we are investing a lot in this uh, unit in order to also uh, recycle, for example, pallet stretch film uh, that we need to find a good collection scheme for. Um, we have already done the work of implementing a post-consumer recycler in stretch film. This is complicated because this film is uh, have a high technical level, but also high demands because uh, load stability is, is uh, a safety thing. So uh, the load doesn't move uh, when it's on, on the truck, for example. Um, and again, internally, we had this discussion a couple of years ago, it was completely impossible, but with the right recycler, we have been able to uh, add 51% uh, PCR in these films with good success, without increasing the thickness, without losing any properties, uh, because we have learned to uh, modify the recipes of the film in order to keep the properties of the thickness as it was. And the last one that is just re recently launched, normally you say that uh, re uh, Recycled plastic cannot uh, be used in food contact materials, <clears throat> especially not polyolefins. We uh, studied the regulation very thoroughly and understood that there, there is an, uh, a gap of evaluation uh, where we thought that by based on, on the ecacity, uh, project actually, where we did the screening of chemical content in recyclers, uh, could motivate to use uh, recyclers of high quality in food contact material encapsulated between virgin layers in a, a multi layer film. Uh, this is the first post consumer recycled plastic film that is approved for food contact material according to the current EU legislation. Uh, this has been a huge project that have been more, more or less research-based uh, internally. And uh, this is our approach, I would say, uh, nowadays that we are more and more going into research phase when we need to prove that a technology or uh, a construction works, even though it contains recycled material. And that was all. Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, yes, please. Uh, questions to Christine. Uh, yeah, if I may, thank you. So very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, very impressed by the in-depth uh, digging of uh, those different aspects. So um, I would have a question. Um, so we're mainly talking about um, uh, polyolefins, uh, um, polyethylene and, and so on. What would be your, your, your thoughts about other, type of, uh, other types of polymeric materials like polyurethanes, for example, or for textile? What would be your, your first two suggestions? Well, it's completely different dependent on the material stream, of course, uh, and application in some cases. If I start with textiles, because I've been working a lot with textiles previously, and it's, this industry is at the beginning of the same journey that the plastic industry have been on for a while. Uh, there are complexities here. First of all, that I don't hear anything about design for recycling. So, so the scope right now is to recycle what's out, out there already and do something about that. And it's often, very often, mix of materials. Uh, I, I think that the textile industry need to work on the design for recycling also in order to make their products recyclable in a better way. 
uh, and without that they will be more or less stuck with a huge mountain of, of uh, uh, textiles to be recycled but with a very low recycling rate. The other thing is that all these textiles are not produced in Europe. The majority is not produced in Europe. Now we have them here. We recycle them here. We create fiber fractions here. We don't have an industry in Sweden any longer that can take care of the, the fibers and do a new material of them. So this is the most interesting part and the, the opportunity I would say for, for uh, the textile industry is to restart the textile industry in Europe because should we trans shall we transport all the fibers back to Bangladesh and China and India? Or how, should, how shall we handle these materials? Um, so today, even if you have a super good sorting facility in, in Malmö, for, for example, the big one that is there, where is the market? So, and, and again, this is the, what we have realized that we need to not only look at our product in our facility and the next life possibly, but we need to take the whole value chain into consideration. And the textile industry have a long way to go there. When it comes to polyurethanes, it's dependent on the application you have, and polyurethane is a super usable material. So you have it in, in coating and you have it in, in mattresses and you have it in different application and dependent on what application you need to have a define the the waste stream and the handling of it polyurethane uh, um, foam polyurethane is actually a good material 